We all know what it feels like at different times to be heartbroken, whether that is uh, when a perfect football season comes to an end for that perfect relationship is ultimately shattered. We have our hopes, our dreams that are just seemingly dashed before our eyes, and that heartbreak feeling can almost leave you sick to your stomach. But I think one of the things that we probably don't often think of when we think of heartbreak is heartbreak in ministry. We, we know that we don't have to look very far into the Gospels to see that Jesus was heartbroken over the people's response, the people that he loved and served and ministered to and ultimately died for. Many times they rejected his salvation. They rejected his love. And he would say to Jerusalem, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city who kills the prophets and stones those who were sent to her. How often I would gather you as a, as a hen gathers her chicks under her wing, but you were not willing. And you can almost just hear the heartbreak in his words. But even before the cross, even before Jesus wept over Jerusalem, I think we're, we're coming to the end of Nehemiah, and we're going to see this morning the heartbreak that Nehemiah went through. And as we think about it from a, if you think about it from a business perspective, Nehemiah at this point has every reason to celebrate. I mean, he's returned, he's come to Jerusalem from Babylon with the intent to rebuild the wall. The wall is finished, it's been dedicated. He can have a smile on his face. He, he facilitated the repopulation of Jerusalem. He convinced people to move into a once abandoned city. Again, he can, he can fill out his annual church profile, so to speak, with joy in his heart. He can go back to King Artaxerxes and say, look, this is what you sent me to do. It has been done. But as we're going to read this morning that Nehemiah's heart was broken because as much as he cared for the building project, as much as he cared about Jerusalem, making it livable and enjoyable again, he cared more about the people to make sure that their spiritual lives were rebuilt. And so our, our story picks up, and we're going to finish out the book of Nehemiah this morning, looking at chapter 13, verses 4 through 31. And we're going to see kind of where, the, where his heartbreak comes from. And so read with me, starting in verse 4. It says, Now before this, the priest Eliashib, who had been in charge of the storerooms of the house of our God, and he was a relative of Tobiah, and had prepared a large room for him where they had previously stored the grain offerings, the frankincense, the articles of the tents of grain, new wine, and fresh oil prescribed for the Levites, the singers, and the gatekeepers, along with the contributions for the priests. And while all this was happening, I was not in Jerusalem, because I had returned to King Artaxerxes of Babylon in the 32nd year of his reign. And it was only later that I asked the king for a leave of absence, so I could return to Jerusalem. And then I discovered the evil that Eliashib had done on behalf of Tobiah, by providing him a room in the courts of God's house. I was greatly displeased and threw all of Tobiah's household possessions out of the room. I, I ordered that the rooms be purified, and I had the articles of the house of God restored there, along with the grain offering and frankincense. I also found that all the I also found out <coughs> because the portions of the Levites had not been given, each of the Levites and the singers performing the service had gone back to his own field. Therefore I rebuked the officials, asking, Why has the house of God been neglected? I gathered the Levites and singers together and stationed them at their post. Then all Judah brought a tenth of the grain, new wine, and fresh oil into the storehouses. I appointed as treasurers over the storehouses the priest, Shalayama, and the scribes Zadok and Pedadiah, of the Levites with Hanan, the son of Zakor, the son of Mataniah, to assist them, because they were considered trustworthy. They were responsible for the distribution to their colleagues. Remember me for this, my God, 
and don't erase the deeds of faithful love I have done for the house of God, of my God, and for its services. And at that time I saw people in Judah treading wine presses on the Sabbath. They were also bringing in stores of grain and loading them on donkeys along with wine, grapes, and figs. All kinds of goods were being brought to Jerusalem on the Sabbath day, so I warned them against selling food on that day. The Tyrians living there were importing fish of all kinds and all kinds of merchandise and selling them on the Sabbath to the people of Judah in Jerusalem. And I rebuked the nobles of Judah and said to them, What is this evil that you are doing, profaning the Sabbath day? Didn't your ancestors do the same so that our God brought all this disaster on us and on this city? And now you are rekindling his anger against Israel by profaning the Sabbath. And when shadows began to fall on the city gates of Jerusalem, just before the Sabbath, I gave orders that the city gates be closed and not opened until after the Sabbath. I posted some of my men at the gates so that no goods could enter during the Sabbath. And once or twice, the merchants and those who sell all kinds of goods camped outside Jerusalem. But I warned them, why are you camping in front of the wall? If you do it again, I'll use force against you. And after that, they did not come, off to come again on the Sabbath. Then I instructed the Levites to purify themselves and guard the city gates in order to keep the Sabbath day holy. Remember me for this also, my God, and look on me with compassion, according to the abundance of of your faithful love. In those days I also saw Jews who had married women from Ashdod, Ammon, and Moab. Half of their children spoke the language of Ashdod, or the language of one of the other peoples, but could not speak Hebrew. I rebuked them, cursed them, beat some of their men, and pulled out their hair. I forced them to take an oath before God and said, You must not give your daughters in marriage to their sons, or take their daughters as wives for your sons. For yourselves. Didn't King Solomon of Israel sin in matters like this? There, were not, there was not a king like him among many nations. He was loved by his God, and God made him king over all Israel. And yet foreign women drew him into sin. Why then should we hear about you doing all this terrible evil and acting unrightfully against our God by marrying foreign women? Even one of the sons of Jehoiada, son of the high priest Elisha, had become a son-in-law to Sandal at the Horonite. And so I drove him away from me. Remember them, my God, for defiling the priesthood as well as the covenant of the priesthood and the Levites. And so I purified them from everything foreign and assigned specific duties to each of the priests and Levites. I also arranged for the donation of wood at the appointed times. And for the first fruits. Remember me, my God, with favor. And so, as we start out this, really, most of this chapter leading to the end of Nehemiah, our, our passage, it starts with this phrase in verse 4 that says, Now before this. And so, we kind of start off with a question that, that if we're just reading this without looking at the chronology, it can become a little bit. Confusing, And so really what we just read from verses 4 to 31 happens before the events of chapter 12, verses 27 through 43 that we've looked at the last few weeks. And so this happens before the wall is dedicated. The wall had been finished, but the dedication of the wall happens after the events of that we just read. And so Nehemiah finishes the completion of the wall, and then he goes back to King Artaxerxes in Babylon. If we remember all the way back to Nehemiah chapter 1, that's where we find Nehemiah, that he's the cupbearer to the king. <clears throat> and it's by God's grace when he hears about this situation that Jerusalem is in, God calls him, and by God's grace allows him in and provides the, the means and the resources for him to go to Jerusalem to begin to rebuild the city. That <clears throat> King Artaxerxes gives him what he needs. And he asks him, how long do you think this is going to take? And Nehemiah gave him a specific time frame. And so now he's going back to honor that time commitment and to also probably give an update for the, the building project, how it has gone. <clears throat> 
And while Nehemiah is gone, while he is back in Babylon, it seems like the spiritual progress has just fallen into decay. That the wall is still standing strong, but the wall around the people's hearts has crumbled. And if you remember, they, they made all these commitments in verse prior to verse 27. They said, we will not neglect the house of our God. We will honor the Sabbath. We're going to obey God's commands. We're going to live holy to him and separate from the world. And so they made all of these commands, but now it seems like each and every command that they made has been broken. And so Nehemiah comes back and, and there's just all these problems that now he has to address. And so that's where the heartbreak comes in, that, that when we are ministering with people and and leading people to Jesus, and especially with new believers. Heartbreak isn't, it's not far around the corner. And so this morning I want us to look at this passage, look at the, <clears throat> the actions that Nehemiah takes, what he does, and the truths here. And I want us to look at it from the perspective that, that we are disciple makers. And, and I want us to see some discipleship truths found here in this passage. And then how we can apply it as we seek to not just become more like Jesus on our own, but as we seek to kind of lead people and, and take them with us as we follow after the Savior. And so our first, uh, <clears throat> our first discipleship truth is that biblical discipleship defeats the threat of worldliness against your temple. Biblical discipleship defeats the threat of worldliness against your temple. I say your temple uh, because we know here there was the actual temple of God, the storerooms that were defiled. We're going to talk about that in a moment. But, but for us, we know that because of when the Holy Spirit comes within us, when we profess faith in our Savior, Jesus Christ, we become the temple of God. And so we have to fight against the worldliness that's a threat to your temple, to your body, to your life. And so each three of these sections that we're going to look at, the threat is worldliness. It's some foreign influence. The first one here is Tobiah. Nehemiah comes back thinking, I've left this place in pretty good shape. The, the people, Ezra has done a good job of reforming the people spiritually. The wall is safe and sound. Everything should be going well. And he comes back and he finds that Tobiah, one of his worst opponents, is living in the, in the storerooms where they store the tithes and the offering. I mean, this is outrageous. If you think back to Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 10, it tells us that as Nehemiah is, he's filled with joy. He's wanting to go back to Jerusalem for its good. But what does Tobiah do? Tobiah is displeased. It's that, we, we talked about that, the goodness of God is met with the evilness. It doesn't overtake the goodness of God, but Nehemiah is wanting to, to, to restore the goodness of God to Jerusalem, and that greatly displeases. It causes evil in Tobiah's heart. And every step of the way, he's been in opposition. And so now Nehemiah comes and he finds him living in the offering plate. Basically, And it gets worse in the sense that we don't know for sure he very well may have been an Ammonite. If he wasn't an Ammonite, he was at least closely associated with the Ammonites, which we saw last week in verse 2 of chapter 13, that they weren't even allowed to come into the assembly of God because they tried to curse God's people instead of bless them. And so you've got somebody that's living where the tithes and offerings should be, who's not even allowed near the assembly of God. And it gets even worse that to make room for Tobiah and his stuff, they had to get rid of the tithes and the offerings. And so it tells us the Levites had to leave serving God in the temple, and they had to go back to their own fields to find work to make money, because... Tobiah is living where he shouldn't be. He's living where the tithes and the offerings are kept, and they're not being distributed. And so Nehemiah comes back, and, and he orders, and he really he kicks Tobiah out. As soon as he gets back, he kicks him out, and he orders that every, basically everything that he has touched 
to be completely purified. And so then in thinking about that for our discipleship, we know that in our walk with the Lord, we have to maintain a pure walk in all areas of our life. But especially as we think about now us discipling others, especially new believers, we know that Satan doesn't want to give up his territory easily. He wants to come back and he wants to make his home in people's lives. And all of the habits, all of the former ways of life, we have to fight to purify both in our life, but we also have to disciple in a way where people are led to, to see that that I need to purify every aspect of my life, every thought, every habit, every every former way of life. We've got to remove the worldliness and help them see to remove the worldliness. And that brings us up. So how do we do that? So we know that biblical discipleship defeats the threat of worldliness against our temple. But how do we do that? And look with me in verse 14. This is the first remember me prayer that Nehemiah prays. And and he says, Remember me for this, my God, and don't erase the deeds of faithful love I have done for the house of my God and for its services. And so he's praying to God, he's like, Remember me. Don't erase what I've done, the things I've done for God's house. He's talking about the purification, removing Tobiah, removing the filth, and purifying. The services for, uh, for the temple and for God are referring here to the tithes and offerings, restoring that so that they can be collected as they're supposed to be collected and then distributed so that the Levites can serve the people instead of having to work in the field. But he says, don't erase the deeds that I've done. And I think the how-to for us of how do we live a life of leading people in discipleship fighting the threat of worldliness is simply to be an example. It's, it's when, when you are an example of someone who is pure, who is dedicating every area of your life to the Lord, that is an example to those who are following you. Be a person who is found in the Word of God, who studies, who reads, who, who's a person of the Word. Be a person of prayer. You can model this, be an example to what it looks like to people to, to take everything to God in prayer. Be an example of what it means to give, both joyfully and sacrificially, of what it looks like to love God more than anything else in life, not even our finances. This was a huge, it's been a huge thing, giving and collecting and distributing the, the tithes and the offerings have been a theme now for several chapters. And I think that's a huge area of need in our discipleship, especially for new believers. Because it's something that goes completely against the culture that we live in. Our culture says you need to get everything that you can. And God's word says you need to give back to him because you can never outgive God. And so if we don't disciple people to give, to tithe, Statistics tell us that, that each generation is giving less and less and less. And so this is a huge area. And again, it's, it's easy to say, why should I tithe? And just to be able to say, well, because God says to. Yes, that is true. And there's really no other reason to do it. But we have to also help them understand that, that every one of God's commands is rooted in blessings for us. That if we obey his commands, there's a blessing that we also get to receive. He's not just giving us laws to kind of keep us in control. He gives us commands to follow so that we can live in his goodness and in his blessings. And helping people see that, that it's possible to give sacrificially and to do it with a smile on your face. To do it joyfully. Because if we don't disciple that into the next generation, that's something I fear is going to be lost. But to be an example, it doesn't mean discipleship isn't about me being perfect. Or, or it's not about you being perfect. It's about saying, look, I know who the perfect one is. His name is Jesus Christ. I am following him with my life. Would you come along and let's follow him together. 
And so again, it's not about us having everything in our life in order before we can do this. It's about simply taking others where we have already come and say, hey, I, I know where I'm going. Won't you please come with me? And so we fight against the threat of worldliness against the temple, against worship by being an example to others, living a pure life, being in the word, prayer, and an example in our giving. So once Nehemiah gets Tobiah out, he gets the offerings re um, put back in place and being redistributed, now he runs into another problem. He finds out that, that people, these foreigners, again, every, every attack is foreign related for the people here in, in chapter 13. Now it's the tyrants who are bringing all kinds of good things and they're selling them in Jerusalem, which isn't bad, except that they're doing it on the Sabbath. They're doing it on the day when people should be uh, worshiping God. And so now the second discipleship truth for us is that biblical discipleship defeats the threat of worldliness against your worship. It defeats the threat of worldliness against your worship. Again, the world will give you all kinds of reasons, and the world will give your disciples, new believers, all kinds of reasons not to gather with the church for worship. I mean, think about all the excuses that, that you hear as you talk about church or as you invite people to church. I mean, the, the excuses go on and on. It's like, well, I can, I can worship from home. Yes, that's true. You can. And you should worship each and every day. But not at the expense of not coming together, forsaking the gathering of gathering together in community to worship with the church. People say, well, God's word even tells us that we all need a day off. Yes, you should take a day of rest. But how messed up has what we do here become if people think that coming to church to worship is somehow equal to work? It should be relaxing. It should be joyful. It should be an expression of, of goodness. I mean, there's football games. There's family parties. There's I've got so much work that I could be doing. I mean, the excuses go on and on and on. And the world will always give you, and Satan will always give those who you are leading excuses to forsake gathering together. But we've got to make sure that we don't let that happen, that we don't let anything come between us and coming together at, to worship God, to leading other people to understand the importance <laughs> of coming together to worship in community. And so how do we do that? I think the how-to of that is, is that we simply need to, to talk about the benefits that we receive from worship together. Let it be something that's, that's verbal, that's on your lips. Talk about the joy that you get from being around like-minded brothers and sisters. Talk about the joy that comes with fellowship. Talk about the joy of of praising God in community with others and, and hearing God's word taught and proclaimed. That should be a joyful experience, something that we can again say that, yes, God does explicitly command us to come together. As a believer, we are commanded to meet together. But again, if you just give them the command, it can seem legalistic. When you help them see that the command is rooted in your blessings, now there's more of a reason. Okay, I, I can start to see why this is important, what this does for me. It's, it's also in this section, really the only, um, this section that, that Nehemiah explicitly talks about the consequences of, of not doing this. He talks about, in, in verse 17 and 18, he says, he's rebuking them for, for profaning the Sabbath, and then he goes right into a question, didn't our ancestors do the same so that God brought all this disaster on us? And I know that if you if you miss a Sunday or if you get out of the habit of coming or if, if you're trying to lead someone in discipleship and, and they're struggling to make time for worship, God may not specifically send physical disaster on their life. But I do believe that there is spiritual disaster that comes from that. The farther we get away from God, the more spiritual disaster is done in our hearts and our minds and our lives.
And I don't know about you, but I think there's enough disaster in our world as it is that we don't need to invite more from God. That, that let's help people understand the joy, the benefit of being in his community. To come together to fight against the threat of worldliness against our worship. In the, the second prayer, he says, remember me, in verse 21, Remember me for this also, my God, and look on me with compassion according to the abundance of your faithful love. So now he's talking about, God, I need your compassion. We need your faithful love. Because I know that as you begin to make disciples, that you're going to make mistakes. We all do. And so to pray to God, say, God, I need your compassion. I need your patience to cover my mistakes. But also the people that we disciple, they're going to make mistakes. They're going to make, they're going to sin and they're going to make a huge mess of things. But to be able to pray and to say, hey, I'm not perfect either. I need God's compassion. And to be able to pray for them and say, God, would you cover their sin in your faithful love? The grace that is greater than our sin. Would they be able to see that? Would they be able to walk in that? That's what Nehemiah is doing. He's asking God's compassion and faithful love to cover this serious issue of failing to worship God as, as the people should. Uh, just another quick plug. I know most of you here today were here in Sunday school. And I want to, I think if we had one more person in the men's class, we'd have to put somebody out in the hallway. Uh, which is good. I, I thank Amen. you for <laughs> that's right. And so, but I do just want to. We have a built-in time of discipleship already in our church. We have a built-in time to gather as community to be accountable. It talks about one of the ways that Nehemiah made sure that the offerings were being distributed. It says that he appointed four different people. He didn't try to do it all on his own. He he came together with people around him to help make sure that this is done. And again, we have this built in in our Sunday school time. Today, we, we started a three-year journey into the gospel project. And I know some of you who've been in Genesis, it seems like forever now, with BSF and others that, that can really, we're in Genesis again. I just ask you to bear with me uh, because we're looking at really the entire storyline of the Bible through the perspective of the gospel. How does the gospel relate to creation? How does it relate to the fall? How does it relate to the flood? And all the way from Genesis to Revelation, that we saw this morning that God is the main character. God the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. And the message of the gospel is central to everything from cover to cover. And what better way to purify our lives and to help other people purify their lives from worldliness than by pressing into God's word with the support of of loving brothers and sisters around them. And so we've got to fight against the threat against our temple and against our worship. Nehemiah gets those things under control. And then verse 23 says, In those days I also saw Jews who had married women from Ashdod, Ammon, and Moab. And listen to verse 24. Half of their children spoke the language of Ashdod, or the language of of one of the other peoples, but could not speak Hebrew. <laughs> Just let that sink in. <clears throat> what would happen if not even a generation, if this continues, people would not be able to speak Hebrew? And it's not like it is today that you can find scripture in practically every written known language. For them to forget Hebrew is to pick this up and be staring at it like we would be staring at it as if it were written in Hebrew. To have no idea how to worship. To have no idea of what God said. And so the, the next thread and the next discipleship truth is that biblical discipleship fights against... I forget what I said. I forgot my words. There we go. Defeats the threat. Biblical discipleship defeats the threat of what's most vulnerable. Biblical discipleship defeats the threat of what's most vulnerable. We talked about this time and again. 
that the most vulnerable area for Israel was this mixed marriage, intermarriage. It led them into idolatry quicker than anything else. We're not going to cover that anymore. But I want us to see this morning that we each have a vulnerable area. It's probably different for each one of us. But there is that one area that Satan knows and that you know that he can get you and, and lead you into sin faster than any other. It could be a thought. It could be an attitude. It could be a habit. It could be an emotion. It could be loneliness. It could be depression. Whatever that most vulnerable area is, biblical discipleship, I believe, is what really fights against that. If we lose that, these vulnerable areas are going to lead us away from God's word. They're going to lead us in a direction that helps us and that causes us to forget the promises of God. That, that if we're swept away long enough, we can become, sadly, like the people in verse 24, that they don't know how to get out of the mess they're in because now they've lost their knowledge and ability to worship God. And so we fight against this area, but again, how do we do it? Even if you look at the, well, one thing is kind of in, it's in our power and in our control. He said, Nehemiah said, you must not. He's telling the people, he's like, look, out of all the things that you've committed to do, you must not neglect God's house. You must not Profane the Sabbath. And now he says, you must not give your sons and your daughters in marriage. And so for us, it's whatever that vulnerable area is, we must not allow the enemy to keep attacking us over and over and dragging us down because of it. And how do we do that? Look at the last verse of, of the book. And this is the last remember me prayer. Nehemiah says, remember me, my God, with favor. So he's asking God, remember me with favor. Again, he's giving this whole process back to God, and, and both for us and as we make disciples. Because you're the, the people that you lead in discipleship, they're going to have vulnerable areas too. And it very well could be different than yours. And so how do we lead somebody with a different issue out of a problem that we may not be familiar with? It's, it's simply to cover the area with God's favor. To ask God's grace to cover it. Remember that, that Jesus died to give us victory over sin and death. And, and that victory wasn't just for him. But it was for all who believe in him. And so each one of you, you have victory over those vulnerable areas in your life. Because of the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The new believers that you're going to disciple, they have victory over their vulnerable areas because of the shed blood of Jesus Christ. There's victory in Jesus we sing about, it, and there's power in the blood. These aren't just songs, but these are truths that we can have victory, that asking God's grace to cover. And that leads us into the how-to is that we don't do it in our own strength. We don't try to outsmart the situation. We don't try to um, outwill whatever that temptation is, but we, we come to God and say, God, without you and without your victory and without your grace and without your blood, Jesus, and the power of your resurrection, I am helpless with this area. But because of all that you have done in me and for me, I'm going to claim your victory over this sin. I'm going to claim your victory over this temptation. And then we walk by faith, believing that the power is not coming from us, but the power is in us by his spirit. And that can lead us as we, as we wrap up Nehemiah. One of the questions I ask is like, why did the, why did the spirit arrange Nehemiah to be worded and, and written like this, with this as the ending? When we know that everything that we read and looked at today happened before what we looked at the last few weeks, why not let it end on a positive note with the people dedicating the wall, with the people making these commitments again not to neglect the house of God, to walk in obedience, to separate from the world? Why didn't it end with the people giving great sacrifices to God? 
because God had caused them to rejoice with his great joy. I mean, that happened before. But I think the only thing I can come up with is that we know the Spirit arranged it the way he wanted it. God's word is infallible, not just in the meaning of it, in the context of it, but in the way that it's worded, in the way it's put together. And it leaves us looking forward to, and, and people who were reading Nehemiah for the first time, it would leave them looking forward to somebody better than Nehemiah. We saw this with Ezra. As great as Ezra was, and as great as the reforms that he made, it ends on a down note. The people guilty standing there in their sin. And we know that, that we need somebody greater than Ezra. We need somebody greater than Nehemiah. We need the good shepherd. Jesus, who had compassion, like Nehemiah and Ezra, that, that when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And Ezra and Nehemiah, they could come in and say, this is what God says you need to do. But Jesus could do more than just say, this is what God said. But he himself could come into the temple and clean it out. He can come into the temple of our lives and clean out every sin, every piece of garbage and replace it with his holiness and his righteousness. And so I think it ends the way it does to keep us looking for that perfect Messiah, looking for that Savior. And so this morning, I, as I look around, I know most of you have trusted, I think probably all of you have trusted in Jesus for your salvation. And so the question for us becomes, okay, how do we, how do we then make disciples? And again, we don't do it in our strength. We don't wait until our spiritual lives are perfect and we know enough and, and we've got enough background and knowledge and experience. But we do what Nehemiah said, that, that prayed and said, God, give me favor. <coughs> God, give me compassion. Give me your faithful love. God, remember and don't erase the things that I have done for you. And we look forward to Jesus. We look to him. And again, we say, I know exactly where I am going. I love talking with Brother Ray because he knows when he dies, whenever that day comes, he knows where he is going to be. And I know many of you have that confidence and that hope and that assurance that that these things were written so that you might know that you have eternal life. And you can say, I know exactly where I am going. Would you come and follow me as I follow Jesus, the perfect one who has died for us? Let me pray this morning.